cargo cult science comprises practices that have the semblance of being scientific, but do not in fact follow the scientific method. The term was first used by physicist Richard Feynman during his 1974 commencement address at the California Institute of Technology. Cargo cults are religious practices that have appeared in many traditional tribal societies in the wake of interaction with technologically advanced cultures. They focus on obtaining the material wealth the cargo of the advanced culture through magical means, by building landing strips, mock aircraft, mock radios, and the like. The speech is widely posted and Feynman adapted it in his book Surely You're Joking, Mr. Feynman. Feynman based the phrase on a concept in anthropology, the cargo cult, which describes how some pre-scientific cultures interpreted technologically sophisticated visitors as religious or supernatural figures who brought boons of cargo. Later, in an effort to call for a second visit the natives would develop and engage in complex religious rituals, mirroring the previously observed behavior of the visitors manipulating their machines but without understanding the true nature of those tasks. Just as cargo cultists create mock airports that fail to produce airplanes, cargo cult scientists conduct flowed research that superficially resembles the scientific method, but which fails to produce scientifically useful results. The following is an excerpt from a speech taken from the book. In the South Seas there is a cargo cult of people. During the war they saw airplanes land with lots of good materials, and they want the same thing to happen now. So they've arranged to imitate things like runways, to put fires along the sides of the runways, to make a wooden hut for a man to sit in, with two wooden pieces on his head like headphones and bars of bamboo sticking out like antennas, he's the controller, and they wait for the airplanes to land. They're doing everything right. The form is perfect. It looks exactly the way it looked before. But it doesn't work. No airplanes land. So I call these things cargo cult science, because they follow all the apparent precepts and forms of scientific investigation, but they're missing something essential, because the planes don't land. Feynman cautioned that to avoid becoming cargo cult scientists, Researchers must avoid fooling themselves, be willing to question and doubt their own theories and their own results, and investigate possible flaws in a theory or an experiment. He recommended that researchers adopt an unusually high level of honesty which is rarely encountered in everyday life, and gave examples from advertising, politics, and psychology to illustrate the everyday dishonesty which should be unacceptable in science. Feynman cautioned, We've learned from experience that the truth will come out. Other experimenters will repeat your experiment and find out whether you were wrong or right. Nature's phenomena will agree or they'll disagree with your theory. And, although you may gain some temporary fame and excitement, you will not gain a good reputation as a scientist if you haven't tried to be very careful in this kind of work. And it's this type of integrity, this kind of care not to fool yourself. That is missing to a large extent in much of the research in cargo cult science. An example of cargo cult science is an experiment that uses another researcher's results in lieu of an experimental control. Since the other researcher's conditions might differ from those of the present experiment in unknown ways, differences in the outcome might have no relation to the independent variable under consideration. Other examples, given by Feynman, are from educational research psychology, particularly perhaps psychology, and physics. Now I'm going to discuss how we would look for a new law. In general, we look for a new law by the following process. First, we guess it. <laughs> then we com... Well, don't laugh. That's really true. Then we compute the consequences of the guess to see what, if this is right, if this law that we guess is right, we see what it would imply. And then we compare those computation results to nature. Or we say compared to experiment or experience. Compare it directly with observation to see if it, if it works. If it disagrees with experiment, it's wrong. And that simple statement is the key to science. 
It doesn't make a difference how beautiful your guest is. It doesn't make a difference how smart you are, who made the guest, or what his name is. If it disagrees with experiment, wrong. That's all there is to it. We're surrounded by fluids every day. Air, water, blood, but weirdly, remarkably little is known about the way fluids move. All fluid flow is governed by a set of equations called the Navier-Stokes equation. Think of them as Newton's second law as applied to the movement of a mass of fluid. But the problem is we can only solve the Navier-Stokes equations for a small number of special cases. For example, we can write down an equation that describes how fluid moves slowly through a long straight pipe. If the fluid is moving much faster, however, the flow becomes turbulent and we no longer have an exact solution. This leaves us with a couple of options. We can either remove less important terms to find solutions that describe only some of the dynamics we're interested in, or we can use huge computers to find extremely good approximations to solutions for us. Coming up with a smooth, globally defined solution to the Navier-Stokes equation is such a huge and important problem that the Clay Mathematics Institute is offering a million dollars to anyone who can do it.